I want to cover everything, we, we could be here for a week or so. So I had to choose, pick and choose. Um, but hopefully, uh, I can show you some new things. First, a bit about myself. Um, I, I, I'm from Santiago, Chile. For those of you that need a bit geography remem reminder, uh, it's that little skinny country in South America. Uh, and that's a nice photo of Santiago when you can see it and there's no smoke. So that's probably <laughs> after our <wedding. laughs> um, I did a bachelor in electrical engineering and, the, and then a master's over there and came in 2008 to do a PhD at UNSW focused on photovoltaic thermal systems. So a lot of some of what you're going to see today was based on, on my PhD. And currently I'm a lecturer at the university and I have uh, three courses um, under my supervision or con uh, convening three courses, life cycle assessment, PV system design, and hybrid <coughs> renewable energy systems, which are very uh, uh, cross-related or very, very related to my research interests. Um, so I'm very lucky that my teaching and my research is kind of um, closely knitted together. I'm also the student experience coordinator, so I try to understand my students, um, you know, experience during the lifetime in the university, trying to understand how do they feel well or not well, and um, it's, it's a challenging process, but I think we're getting, we're getting somewhere there, try to understand our students which are changing a lot quicker um, than we, we imagine. Anyway, that's enough about me. Um, so uh, my interest in PV systems and what that means is I try to summarize a bit of what I want in PV everywhere and basically is based on low cost electrification. So you can see in my view PV will be everywhere supplying services, energy services to mobility, buildings, waste, health, water, food, manufacturing and all the ambits or areas of our society. And why I think this is going to happen, or it's already happening. Um, I go back to 2012 and the World Renewable Energy uh, Forum that um, Stephen Chu, the US Secretary of Energy at that time, said something like this. Uh, I'm, I'm, I will give you a link to his talk, it's roughly an hour talk, but back in 2010 and 12, this is my interpretation. So basically, say we can debate when renewable energy are going to become the main. Uh, energy sources. Uh, not if for him the change was happening even back then. And it might happen before or after, but it was clear. And his point was that that wasn't going to happen because renewable energy was green and sustainable, but because it was going to be cheaper than <coughs> any other option. And his, his challenge for all the presence in that uh, forum was you have to make it as cheap as possible if you really want to have a shot at making it happen. And as you can see, that has happened. So he was he was saying the, those words. Um, sorry, if I can. Oh, anyway, around here in 2012, where PV um, price index in Australia was around two and a half dollars per watt, and this is nowadays. We're almost close to one dollar per watt. So two and a half times difference in less than ten years, in seven years, which is incredible for any product. Um, so this is for um, PV price index for commercial and residential, and this has happened mainly because we've increased the efficiency of the solar cells and the modules constantly during the last years. So. You can see here that we have modules now that are 24% efficient, 20% efficient. Um, a lot of people still have this idea or this memory that PV is inefficient, that it's 10%. Well, we doubled that in the last 12 years. Uh, so now it's possible to go to any store and, and get you know 20% or 21% modules. They're a bit more expensive than the less efficient ones, but even 18% efficient modules have become the standard. And to give you an ex uh, uh, in a comparison, um, the efficiency of an internal combustion engine to the wheel is around 20%. So we are not many different to all the energy systems that we've lived to with for hundreds of, for 100 years or something like that. So it's not like PV is this 
you know, an efficient system anymore. It's, it's actually a reality. So we improve efficiency, but also because with getting better at manufacturing the system, we have uh, reduced the cost for every unit that they produce. So this is what is called the learning curve. So you can see at the beginning we have an experimental phase in the early years when there was somehow uh, an improvement for every amount of energy, uh, sorry, for um, PV um, manufactured. And we, we were getting very good at it, at 30%. Then, of course, there was the industry development phase that it was a bit harder because it required industry to grow and to learn. But then again, in the late years, so since 2018, we are in a mass production phase where basically we're back to a 40% um, learning curve, which is incredibly high for many products. Batteries at the moment are having a similar learning curve, which means that they're going to get as cheap as PV has gotten during these years. And this, this projection happened around 2010, and they got it quite right. We are almost there with PV panels at the moment. Um, I think around 30 cents per watt, um, US, US cents. So what does this mean? What does the improved efficiency and, and lower cost means? That uh, we actually are the cheapest way to generate electricity. This is, a, this is and, and it's not me saying it, I mean, um, it would be, <laughs> I could say it, but, but this is actually from the CSRO. So what you see here is the levelized cost of energy per megawatt hour of energy generation. And you have here different types of um, generation systems from coal <coughs> to um, renewable energy. And if you see here, you can see the wind and photovoltaics are the lowest way to generate energy. And this is what is happening right now. Of course, if you include battery, the, the, the cost increases. And this is, um, you know, pump hydro, which is what Andrew Blake is from this university actually has been pushing quite rightly so. Um, but even if you compare these values with black coal and gas, they are there. And this is without having any penalty for emissions. If we compare apples to apples and assuming that we have carbon capture, then you see how the prices skyrocket. So PV and wind are the cheapest way to generate electricity today. That's the bottom line. And this is the transformation that will happen because the energy is the cheapest. And you've seen AGL and other companies not wanting to invest in coal. And it's not because they are greens or because they want to be sustainable. It's because of this. Their revenue in the future would be better if they invest in renewable energy. And you can see that the market is uh, voting with the money. So this is from the Clean Energy Regulator, and you can see that we already have around 4.7 gigawatts of capacity in the system, another 5.5 gigawatts under construction, and another one and a half gigawatt with PPI sun. So in a couple of years, we're going to have around 12 gigawatts of new capacity in our system. Yes? This gigawatt? Yep. I find it hard to get my head around how big is a gigawatt. Can you give us an analogy for that, please? Ooh. It's a lot. Um, OK, so a house uses around 30 kilowatt hours per day. Right. So gigawatt, gigawatt, uh, one gigawatt is one million kilowatt hour. So that's hundred. So um, if it will one gigawatt, well, I don't have that much, but it will be something like a thousand houses. So ten thousand houses. Yeah, ten thousand houses. So it's it's a little town, right? So when you have fifteen or 12 gigawatts, we're talking about city level and a big chunk of Australia's energy requirements. But yeah, good point. So anyway, 
that, that was the, like the introduction, PV is cheap, so why wouldn't we have PV everywhere? Why? Um, so I want to take you now to a couple of these points, because again, we can go through all of them. But I would like to start almost at the back, on waste. If we assume that PV would be everywhere, then that means that we're going to have a lot of waste of PV in the future, because we're going to install these systems and eventually they will have to be the commission and they're going to end up somewhere. Where does it end up? It depends on regulations, but also on the technology available. At the moment in Australia, um, there are some talks about, especially led by uh, Sustainability Victoria, about increasing, <coughs> including a regulation so PV doesn't end up in the landfill. And now that's really necessary because that's the way to push the, the industry in the market. But we don't have the technology to recycle these panels. Europe started 10 or 15 years ago, so we could import that technology, but I'm going to explain later why we can probably do better than that. So we will have a significant challenge in the future with management of waste in solar photovoltaics. So um, this is a report from IRENA, and they estimate that by 2050, we're going to have 78 million um, metric tons of waste in PV. And that is equivalent to 4,500 4, gigawatts of PV waste. We're talking about gigawatts again. So imagine everything that it was installed in Australia was 12 gigawatt, gigawatts. That's a lot. There will be tons and tons of PV systems. And um, basically by 2050, this means that PV waste could exceed 10% of the record of global e-waste that happened in 2014. And what we want to make sure is that we don't have a waste problem when this happens. So we don't, um, if we really want to be a sustainable technology and a sustainable industry, we need to take care of the waste. So basically, we need to create a new circular economy where we are able to recover materials from these panels so they can go either to other industries or to make new source modules. Um, so we estimate that by 2050 there will be 2 billion new panels that could be created <coughs> by using this material that we could recover. But there are costs associated with this. And at the moment, the cost of recycling is not enough to cover these new panels. So someone will have to pay. Or we need to get better and make recycling cheaper. And that's what we are trying to do at the moment. Now, we have gotten better to recover materials. So this is a percentage of weight material recovered over the years. And there are different systems. And you can see how, at the moment, um, the best system can recover 96% of the weight of a solar panel, which is a lot. But unfortunately, these systems are what I call generation one of recycling. Basically, they put all they put a PV panel and they crush it, and then they recover the material in kind of like in its original way. So they can recover the silver, they can recover the silicon, but they are um, they are not they are of lower value than in the way that we're in the PV system. Because if you have a silicon wafer, a solar cell, and now you have the bits and pieces, you have to do processes to put it back again, or you can sell it as fixed stock for all the processes. And this is the approach of e-waste, uh, and that's why we have that generation one, and that's the one that ha has achieved 96% of recovery, but the value recover of the materials are not ideal. Generation 2 is kind of like a mix between Generation 1 and Generation 3. And the idea is that you can recover full bits and pieces like the aluminum frame and like the glass, but everything else is again going to the shredder and to recover the materials. What we, what we are trying to achieve is Generation 3. Basically, you have a PV panel and you are able to magically delaminate it in the main components so they can you reuse the components. Um, 
in a nice way. So a BB panel is usually composed of a frame, a glass, an encapsulant, the solar cells, another encapsulant, the back sheet, and the junction box. And this encapsulant is what is called EDA. Um, that's typical encapsulant that we use is basically like a film that becomes a glue and holds the whole panel together. And what we're trying to do is to separate all those components so we can reclaim them. And this is a photo of a roll of EVA. That's what happens be before it, um, it's what we call laminated. So when you create a solar panel, you put all those layers together, you apply some pressure, and you heat it up. Just like you are doing a um, melt sandwich, how do you call those? Oh. Uh, yeah, just imagine like a big jaffler where you put a PV and you put it down, and that actually curates the EVA. So what happens is that EVA is unlinked before that pressure and heat happens. So all those model molecules are not necessarily uh, linked together. You apply heat and then some hydrogen um, escape, and that creates these links with carbon, which make, makes that EVA strong, very strong. And this is an irreversible process, unfortunately, because we lost hydrogen. So we can't do some kind of magic thing and go back. We have to find a way to either break those links or get rid of the EVA in a different way to actually be able to separate these components. And this is the main challenge at the moment. It's not easy. Um, our first line of attack is actually chemical. So we are, try we are trying to break those bones um, with solvents. And we've gone through organic and inorganic solvents and try EVA by itself and see what works. And we realized that toluene um, was the best option. Oh, this is not... Sorry. And so we did a little module, what we call a one cell module. And we put it in a dish with toluene. And we wait 24 hours. And we could see that something was happening there. We wait, we wait for a week, and clearly something was happened. And then at the end, we were able to separate the back sheet, the glass, but we had this kind of gooey, uh -huh. jelly mess. <laughs> so basically, what <coughs> happened is that the EVA kind of sucked all the children, and it lost its adhesive. Um, you know, properties, but we destroyed the cell. So this was encouraging because now we can recover a couple of things, but what we want to recover is actually the cell in its original form. So we're still trying, and this is a bit like cooking. You try different recipes until you get the one that works the best. Um, this is another example. It's, um, instead of chemical, we're also using thermal treatments, and with this, we did this very little solar cell. It was like this size, right? This size. And we put it in an oven with a heat treatment, and at the end, it was separated. So what happened is that we were able to burn all that EVA, which, you know, got dissipated to the air, and we were then able to recover uh, all the components. So we said, have you ever watched the Mythbusters TV show? <laughs> so it's like the same, we, we started small and now we scale it up. So then we went to, okay, let's try with a bigger cell. And it didn't work that well. Um, so what happened is that we still were able to recover the tabbing, so all the connectors and the, and the, and the glass, but the cell was broken. So again, it's a bit better, it's a bit closer, but not quite there yet. And what happens is that when you heat up this in an oven, the EVA that starts burning actually releases gas. And that gas is trapped within the back sheet and the cell and the, and the glass. And it doesn't have anywhere to go, and that, and that, um, um, that bubbles, those bubbles <coughs> end up breaking the cell. 
So we said, okay, let's try to do it gently, right? Another recipe. Instead of going up very hot, let's try to go smoothly and see if that gas has time to escape. Um, it didn't work. <laughs> so what happened is that the, the, the whole uh, cell and the components, the plastic components, the EVA and the gas sheet that is made of tedlar, they basically became charred. And once something has been charred, you can't actually burn it. Uh, so you can see how the bubbles of EPA got trapped there, and basically we can't do anything with that. So um, it's not all bad news. Latest results are very promising, and we believe that there are ways to recover full solar cells and to recover all the parts. Um, unfortunately, they are too new to show them. Um, but the high hope at the moment. Now, if we are able to recover the cells, we did this other experiment, and we showed that we can actually recover the metals with a simple chemical process. So, if we are ever able to recover the cells, which looks um, possible, then we can return this solar cell back to its original form. So we can put it back into the manufacturing and create a new solar cell. And all the, all the groups and all the researchers have shown that it's possible and that actually you can achieve uh, efficiency very close to the original. Now, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be doing this work completely if we were not including life cycle assessment. Uh, can you raise your hand if you know what life cycle assessment is? Yeah? Okay, lots of you. Um, for, for those of you that you don't, it's basically a methodology that accounts each step of the life of our product. And by doing that, we are able to assess the total environmental impact of a product during its lifetime. So what we've been doing is um, including life cycle assessment in our processes to understand which recycling process is better and compare that to all the, um, all the options. So here for example um, we have human health impact of different type of solar modules using multi-silicon or monosilicon for landfill incineration, reuse and then different type of recycling. And it was clear that if we recycle the system, we actually achieve a lower environmental, I mean, human health impact. And the same happens with resources in other type of environmental impact. Reuse is, I might explain that, is having an old panel at the end of life and extend its life by doing some kind of um, repairing process for another period of time. So that's why it actually improves uh, our landfill and incineration, but it will reach an end of life eventually, and then it will go to landfill. That was the assumption. So this is encouraging. Recycle can actually improve and reduce the sustainable, I mean, the environmental impacts of PV over its lifetime. However, we realized that transportation was incredibly important in this process. Um, and that if we had, if we include transportation, let's assume that the recycling, um, you know, place was 100 or 50 kilometers um, um, longer way than the landfill, then all the benefits of recycle actually are cancelled. So this is a logistical problem but it's required to understand that we actually need a full system approach in order to make sure that we have uh, lower environmental impacts. So our research shown that for recycling to be the best option, it must be no more than 80 kilometers away than an unfilled or incineration plant. Yes? Um, is that generally true with all recycling? Ooh, I would say yes, but it will depend on the portion of transport for that particular product. So, 
sometimes when you recycle something, the benefits are bigger than this. In that case, it might be longer away, a, a longer way that you need to travel in order mm -hmm. to cancel it. But yeah, yeah. Now, um, this is also assuming a diesel truck. If we move this to a PV-powered electric <laughs> truck, then it will change again. Right. <coughs> and this is the this is the complexity of life cycle assessment. There are hundreds of variables that we need to understand. How am I doing? I'm yeah. good. Good. Yeah. All right. All right. So that's a bit about uh, recycling life cycle assessment. So in summary, it's looking it's looking very promising. It's a new industry, but there are still challenges, and we need to make sure that we have the technology and the implementation. To, um, to ensure that the that sustainable development uh, using PV systems. Yes. Uh, with landfill and incineration, you surely would have long-term uh, environmental impacts and and, again, and eventually climate change impacts. Yep. So, have you considered any of these things? And also with incineration, health impacts and air pollution. And again creating another waste uh, product uh, that is actually toxic. That's right. So this is a summary, but uh, mm -hmm. for example, recipe human health includes uh, pollution and uh, emissions to estimate the impact on human health. So there are about 12 indicators, mm -hmm. one of them being climate change, and it really depends on which indicator you're looking at. Um, what recipe tries to do is to group them together. Um, so it's kind of like a average indicator, if you want. So can you define recipe again, Jose? Sure. So uh, recipe is just um, a methodology to um, calculate the sustainable, uh, sorry, the environmental impact indicators of a life cycle assessment. Um, it is quite complex in, complex in itself. So it has twelve individual or maybe seventeen individual indicators that then are grouped in. Um, human health, resources, and environmental impact. Mm -hmm. So, in this in this uh, paper, we have a more detailed result of of this uh, process. Anyway, um, now I would like to move to buildings because this is where I've spent a lot of time during my research career in the last ten years. And specifically, how we use photo photovoltaic thermal system for heating and cooling. Um, so I will quickly introduce PVT. Basically, you can imagine there is kind of this um, baby born from a PV module and a solar collector, because that's that's what it is. It's basically a solar collector in which you, on top of it, put uh, solar cells. Um, and you have a new system that is able to provide heat uh, either in way um, as hot water or as hot air and electricity. So it's actually a cogeneration system. So it's able to provide two types of energy at the same time. Um, interestingly, you can have it with an additional glass cover or without a glass cover and that has important implications. We will see that later. Now, this is the solar spectrum, and it's hard to see, but that kind of gray area is actually what can be absorbed and used by silicon solar cell. And it's basically up to here and there. So it can't use all, all the spectrum, which means that um, a solar cell at best can. Um, 50% of what of the solar energy, if it's absorbed, it will be released as heat. Right? Silicon is worse. Silicon can do about 32%, so roughly 70% will be um, 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 it's, I'm trying to find non-technical words. It will be released. Well, it, the the energy will be absorbed and it will create heat inside and eventually release. And how much is released depends on the environment, and you know it's a hot surface basically. 
So about half of the energy in the solar spectrum can be converted to electricity. This is for very, this is the multi-junction limit. Mm -hmm. So if we have a lot of solar cells, the ideal limit is 49%. At the moment, the, I think the real practical limit has been 42 or 43%. Uh, for silicon, it's, a lot like, it's less than that. Uh, so basically the point is a lot of energy is not used, it's not converted to electricity and that energy ends up as heat yes. and that means that the solar cell will get warmer. Now, not many people know this but a warmer solar cell is a less efficient solar cell. So we actually want to have cooler solar cells. Um, so. Cooling a PV module is a good idea because if we cool a PV module, it increases the efficiency and actually more of that energy is, is transferred uh, as heat and as electricity. So in theory, PVT is a good idea because we can cool those solar cells. We can decrease the temperature of the cell by cooling it with a fluid. It can be water or air. Um, this increases the, ef the efficiency of the cell, so we get more electricity. We can use the heat waste, the, the waste heat for other purposes. <coughs> uh, so it's a good idea. Win-win situation. Now, in theory, yes, but there are some problems. So there are some limitations to this. And PVT has been around for a long time, more than 40 years. And you don't see many PVT systems in the wild, and that's because um, there are some limitations that I'm going to discuss. So the good things about PVT and the potential is high energy density, so if you have a small roof, it would be better for you to have PVT than a bit of PV in a bit of solar thermal, for example, if you want to have hot water. You have potential reduction of installation costs compared with two systems. Um, you have a high combined efficiency, so a PVT system can reach 60% or 80% efficiency. If we're talking about pushing up solar cell efficiency, well, PVT can actually reach very high efficiencies. That's a lower payback time and lower energy payback time compared to PV. Um, it could generate most of the power required for a house, in Australia at least. And it also has potential use in commerce and industry. And also, it gives you architectural uniformity because you don't have two different types of panels. You have only one panel that is, panel that is producing the PV. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. And this is kind of a hard um, graph to follow, but basically it's saying that if you want a big temperature rise in your water, let's say that we want hot water, and we want to have maybe 40 degrees water at the end, it means that we're going to have to heat that water a bit, a lot, um, let's say 20 degrees. The more we heat the water, the less will be the efficiency of the system. Right. And it makes sense, because if we want hot water at the end, it means that the panels is not going to be cooled that much, because we, we will have to have that high temperature. And also, if the panel has higher temperature, it will lose more energy to its environment. So thermally, the thermal efficiency will be lower, and the electrical efficiency will be lower. But if we actually, let's say that we only have one five temperature, five degree temperature increase, let's say that the water is 20, 20 and <coughs> 25, it means that our module temperature will be 25, it will have cooler cells, it will produce more uh, electricity, and because the temperature of the module is lower, it will not lose that much energy. So, PVT is about trade-offs. It's about, do I want heat or do I want electricity? And how do I manage that trade-off? Because we can't have a lot of both, we have to choose. And it's also it's about efficiency or temperature rise or efficiency and exergy. Do I want more efficiency or do we want 
a big temperature rise, which in theory some uh, some people could use it to create work. Um, I don't think it's the right right approach. I think what we want to do in PVT is use low temperature systems uh, and <coughs> go through efficiency. Anyway. Um, this is an example of what I did a um, long time ago. I actually built a PVT system for developing countries using everything that you can buy in Bunnings, which is not really developing countries. But the idea, was that, <laughs> <laughs> the idea was that there were potential materials that would be available, right? Um, except for the PV panel, the PV panel I got it from a warehouse, everything else, uh, all the pipe, all the pumps, and everything, it was. From and um, I bought a plastic sheet that has some channels at the back and I was able to glue that plastic channel into the MyPV system so water will come from this pipe, go all the way up and come up the top. So, um, some details there of the system. The system worked really well for around two years. Um, but then when I disassembled, I realized that a lot of things were not in the best workmanship. Um, that's, I didn't have a quality control process. Um, but if we ever go into industry, those are the things that we can improve. Now, I had two panels, as you can see over there. This was a normal panel, and this was a PVT panel. And over the course of almost a year, um, we could see that the PVT panel always produced more electricity than the PVT panel, uh, which was the idea. Um, I was very happy. And those panels were 11% efficient. And it's just, you know, it's incredible that now, so they were 110 watt panels, and now you can buy 300, 350 watt panels. It's mm -hmm. incredible. And it's important, I'm going to show you later why. Um, now, the only month that um, PV, PVT was lower than PV was during June, July, because I turned off the system. There was no cooling. Right. And that means that the system was in stagnation. Now, PV, P, PVT panels have insulation at the back to stop heat going out because you want to recover that heat. This means that if you don't cool them, they actually would be hotter than a normal PV panel. And that's one of the biggest implementation problems. What do you do when you, you don't need more heat? So if you are heating hot water, you have a shower, you don't need any more heat. That means that those PVT, PVT panels will not get cooled. And that means that the efficiency will be lower than normal PV panels. So what do we do with that extra heat? We have some ideas and I can tell you later. But basically, we created a very a detailed model using an RC network that was really as accurate as possible between experimental data. So this is experimental and simulated data. You can't see the difference because they are very close together and this is the error. So the error is less than 1%. So then we were able to use this model to um, run all the simulations. So I said, okay, let's assume that we want to run a domestic hot water system in Sydney. And we will have one system that doesn't have an, a cover and another system that has an additional cover. You can imagine if you have a glass cover over a PV panel, it will get warmer, right? So it will be better for thermal applications, but the one without the cover will be better for electrical applications. And that's basically what we got. If we don't have an uncovered system, if we have an uncovered system, we produce a lot of more electricity and only a little bit of thermal energy. While if we cover uh, the PV system or the PVT, we get a lot more thermal energy and less electrical energy. So this, this is interesting. It means that if you know your load, you can actually have some impact on how you design your system to have either more or less thermal energy or more or less electrical energy. And this is what happens with a cogeneration system. Basically, you need to make sure that you match your electricity and thermal load to what you're generating. Um, another thing that we were able to prove is that you can do a sky cooler. 
at night. Because you have water, let's say, running, we can actually cool water during the night. Um, and this happens because this is the average time, uh, average ambient temperature at night, and this is the average sky temperature. So we, we were measuring sky temperature during this process, and you can see there is a good uh, 10 to 20 degrees lower than the ambient temperature. So the panel is losing heat to the sky and to the ambient, but mostly to the sky at night. Um, so, yes? I just ask, so this is for Sydney, so obviously in, in, the, in Canberra we would have a different setup for the whole thing, or in Brisbane. That's or right. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and this is one of the another complications of a PV system that it has to be designed for a particular application in a particular place. So it requires a lot of knowledge. Not like PV that you can put it anywhere, basically the same system. Um, so anyway, we were able to show that we um, we can achieve even in Sydney high levels of cooling, <coughs> even in summer, in winter of course, but also in summer. Um, so this is experimental data, and we were able then to run simulation data for different parts of the world. Um, Sydney, Singapore, Tucson, and Hamburg. Um, Tucson is hot and dry, but cold at night. It's like a blizzard climate. So um, that was a perfect location, for example, to do relative cooling at night. But even in places like Singapore, we can still achieve something. So Singapore is... Uh, you know, clouded most of the time, you still can get around 400 watts per hour per square meter. So, one of the things that you can do when you have excessive heat, and this will most likely happen in summer, is to provide solar cooling. So, um, these are all photos, right now the system is finished, but basically we're doing a PVT air collector, and that air will be used in winter to heat the, that little room here, and in summer to cool using desiccant cooling and mm -hmm. indirect evaporative cooling. Um, so we don't have to go through this. This is a psychometric charge of the of the system. Um, this particular model has ground source, but basically we can grab um, air at this temperature, 30 odd degrees, and quite humid and we can deliver it at 20 something degrees and quite dry, which is enough to provide um, a comfortable space. So, PVT seems like a good, a good idea. We have high energy density, we have high thermal and PV efficiencies, if it's well designed, and if we match the generation to the loads. Um, we can do cogeneration and even try generation if we do night sky cool, so we can produce heat, electricity, and, and cool, cooling. But it is more complex. Um, one of the main issues is that you need a plumber and electrician, and they need to work together, and we need standards for those things. And if Europe has been trying to provide standards, but they're not there yet. So there is a way to go. There is not great penetration of market. There have been a couple of companies in Germany, in Italy, in Turkey, but we need like a China moment in the sense that we need mass production to in order to become so PVT becomes ubiquitous and low cost. Now there are interesting options and I will run quickly. Um, I did an experiment, another experiment, I graphed data from different solar cells and different efficiencies and real, I realized there was a correlation. And basically, the more efficient the solar cell, the lower the temperature coefficient. That means that the more efficient the solar cell, heat is less of a problem. So I assumed three levels of efficiency. Uh, just to give you an example, if we get to 40%, a PV module will be around 580 or 600 watts. And then I run a similar simulation to the <coughs> domestic hot water system. And I realized that depending on the efficiency of the solar cell, you can again adjust the amount of thermal energy or electrical energy that you have. So that allows, um, that allows again 
for a design um, adjustment that you can have depending on your particular load. Now, more interestingly, if we get rid of the blue bars and we only look at the electricity, you can see that when it's very efficient, it really doesn't matter if you're running it hot or cold, the efficiency of the system remains almost the same. Um, so the PV doesn't suffer as much because of these low temperature coefficients. So there is an opportunity, there is future. PVT could become a big thing, especially for buildings maybe used in facades, where we can actually capture all that heat in a building and, and use, the, use it for other purposes. So we're doing well. Um, last bit I want to talk about food and, and this is very close to my heart and a project that we are trying to launch at the moment and I think it's quite exciting so it would be good to see if you think about this and think the same basically it's about agrivoltaics which is combining agriculture and photovoltaics it sounds crazy at the beginning but actually there are a lot of potential benefits so first off we have the potential to increase the land efficiency so we have the same amount of land that we can produce electricity and food from it. Um, we reduce the water use because we shade the plants. Uh, we can improve the crop yield uh, because we can provide wind protection, we can provide shelter, uh, frost protection and also shading. Uh, especially in Australia, most of our crops are not limited by sun, but are limited by nutrients and water. Uh, we have enough sun here. And more importantly, I think it can provide farmers with an additional revenue stream. So they can really start to farm what they want instead of what, um, you know, they, sometimes they might be forced to do because they don't have another option. Uh, so this might actually reduce some of the risk of being a farmer. So there have been some examples in Germany, uh, Fraunhofer Institute, that they've done a couple of demonstration projects and this is the result, this is actual, based on actual data from 2018. Uh, they have potatoes and they have, you know, PV panels and they were able to pro produce 103% of potatoes for that land. So, let's say the same amount of potatoes, but they were able to produce 83% solar energy. So, 180% of land efficiency, if you want. France, they're doing the same. They are not like the Germans that are focused on efficiency, they are focused on wine. Um, <laughs> um, so wineries are actually threatened by climate change and you know the amount of flavors and sugar and alcohol that you, you get from the grapes. So they're very worried. So they're using a smart shading to limit the excess of light and heat uh, to, pre to preserve the uh, the you know, aromatic <coughs> profiles of wines and etc. Um, et um, they also managed to save 20% of water and they can even inc increase their yields. But does this mean that if wineries in the Barossa Valley used PVs, not so many would have to move to Tasmania? <laughs> yep. It is an option. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what actually we want to explore in Australia because we have a lot of range of climates, right? And there might be different technologies or different um, um, arrangements um, that might be more suitable for different places. Uh, another example is Japan. I like it because they call, they call it solar sharing. Um, so they usually install the modules around 3 meters high and a portion of 33% shading and they have a manual tilting mechanism so the farmers can actually do it themselves. And this is for a small farms around a thousand square meters, but this, there are hundreds of these ones, or thousands in Japan. So that's, that's the idea, is that you have a, a ground floor and a first floor, and then on the first floor you have PV, and in the ground floor you have chickens, or playground, or uh, you know, plants. And this is how it looks like, they actually have uh, a very nice community over there, and they estimated that if 20% uh, of the cultivated area in Japan could be converted to solar sharing. They could produce um, a lot of the required energy. So this is the total demand of the country. So they could produce almost half of the electricity demand. 
So you might say, well, this is Japan, right? They, they don't have a space. Why is this important in Australia? Um, we believe that there will be competition for land, that the good arable lands are actually very similar in characteristic to what you require for a solar farm. But also because we can help the farmers and we can get better crops, uh, lower water use, etc. etc. Mm -hmm. So, agriculture in Australia, ITP Renewables, uh, UNE, and UNESCO are looking for funding uh, to do a test of feasibility study. Um, it seems that agriculture especially brings many benefits to arid zones uh, because of the management of shade and water. Um, and it has the potential to provide um, means to achieve high density horticultures, uh, for example, greenhouses. So, if we manage to get that test of study, then the idea is to run uh, several demonstration projects in different climates, uh, different crops, and different technologies. Mm -hmm. what's, um, the, what's the implication for you doing that in the winter time? In terms of the efficiency of growing. Sorry, in the. Would you not be running a risk of having a detrimental effect on the growing season in the winter? No, so it, it, it really depends on the crop, and this is why more research has to be done. But there's been some studies in ASU that actually during winter PD can provide frost protection. Mm. And uh, because it shades, you. It, a lot of the systems are going with tiltable systems, so you can actually tailor how much shade you do want. So you might lose a bit of efficiency in the PV, but it really you're catering mostly for the plant. So it's how PV can help growing stuff and not the other way around. So can you use the water to cool that system and then put that onto the soil to warm the soil? Yep. Yep. Um, so I don't have a picture here, but there's some people that have done that in Africa, they actually wash the panels and that goes to a, a gutter and that water the plants. Um, so this is why I see PV everywhere. Right? It's about trying to find application that actually produce a better outcome um, for the two systems. Um, and, yep. So there, there are many solar farms that look like that without the grape vines or whatever. That's right. So, it makes me think you could just start planting crops underneath existing um, PV farms. It, the, what the difference is the height. Mm -hmm. um, these solar farms tend to have higher rows of PV panels because you want to be able to walk or get a tractor. Or, but if you actually want to just do hand labor, it's possible. Now, the other benefit is that by having a green uh, pasture that uh, stop dust, actually you reduce the soiling for that side, potentially, mm -hmm. which again, improve the PV. Yeah. So there are many applications, and I'm going to finish with this one. Um, I think we just need to be creative, and solar will be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.